help with the cost of living is our number one priority. Getting the budget onto a stronger foundation and getting wages moving again are essential elements of this. So too is the targeted support we've been rolling out over the last year. When I spoke to this conference a year ago, the week after our October budget, I explained the two key reasons behind our decision to return over 90 per cent of revenue upgrades to the bottom line, rather than funnel them off into one-off measures. Firstly, because we understood that a stronger budget would better protect us against uncertainty in the future. And secondly, because spraying money around in search of a headline, as our predecessors so often did, would make the problem of inflation worse, not better. And that's why, through the past year, we've focused on providing responsible cost of living relief that delivers an economic dividend, taking pressure off families without putting pressure on inflation, helping people through adversity in a way that builds for our future productivity and prosperity. And this is what ties together the $23 billion in cost of living relief that our government is delivering, a targeted and comprehensive plan that has actually taken half a point off inflation through the year, starting, of course, with cheaper childcare. Making childcare more accessible and affordable is an economic reform that boosts productivity and participation for working women in particular. It has also delivered real and immediate help for around 1.2 million family budgets since July. Childcare costs decreased by 13 per cent in the September quarter, and without our reforms, it's estimated they would have increased by 6.7 per cent. So almost a 20 per cent turnaround as a result of the conscious decision that the government made. It's the same story for energy bill relief. We brought together state and territory governments to agree on $3 billion in direct help for over 5 million households and 1 million small businesses. And we coupled this with action to shield industry and households from the worst of global price spikes. As a result, the Australian Energy Regulator has found the average wholesale electricity prices for the September quarter were less than half those seen at the same time last year. But if our opponents had succeeded in blocking energy bill relief, as they sought to do all the way along, then households would be paying hundreds of dollars more than they are today. And that is the difference between taking action and just saying no, between making a positive difference and relentless negativity. We see it in housing too. We know there are pressure points across the housing market at the moment for renters, mortgage holders and aspiring homeowners. And that's why we brought together the states and territories to agree on the most comprehensive set of housing reforms in a generation, aimed, of course, at boosting supply, delivering a better deal for renters, unlocking new land and accelerating approvals, alongside which we have delivered the biggest increase in Commonwealth rent assistance in 30 years, and the biggest investment in affordable and social housing for more than a decade with our $10 billion Housing Australia Future Fund, which I'm pleased to say commenced yesterday. This is all about helping with the cost of living now and building more affordable, well-located homes in the future. In healthcare, our two waves of reform on cheaper medicine have seen Australians save over $180 million on 16 million cheaper scripts this year. The Medicare Urgent Care Clinics we have opened in suburbs and regions around Australia have already seen over 59,000 presentations. Importantly, those are 59,000 visits not made to the hospital emergency departments which are under pressure. And just yesterday, the biggest investment in Medicare in its 40-year history took effect. 